Yeah, yeah. All right, I think we're on. We're ready to go. Let's take our songbooks, please, and turn to number 570. Boy, that's on there good and strong. 570. Each day I'll do a golden deed by helping those who are in need. My life on earth is but a span, and so I'll do the best I can. Life's evening sun is sinking low a few more days. I must go to meet the deeds that I have done where there will be no setting sun to be a child of God each day my light must shine along the way I'll sing his praise while ages roll and strive to help some troubled soul. Life's evening sun is sinking low. A few more days and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done where there will be no setting sun while going down life's weary road I'll try to lift some traveler's load I'll try to turn the night to day make flowers bloom along the way Life's evening sun is sinking low. A few more days and I must go to meet the deeds that I have done where there will be no setting sun. Good morning, church. It's good to see each of you this morning. Very glad that you chose to come out and worship God and fellowship with us here at Pleasant Valley. If you're visiting with us, we want to extend a special welcome to you and an invitation to return at your earliest convenience. We are very glad to have you here with us this morning. A few announcements that we need to make before we continue with our worship. Pep groups have started meeting again. If you are not part of a group and want to be, please let Lonnie or Karen Myers know. We can get you added to a group. The fall retreat is coming up next weekend, October 8th through the 10th. The Saturday in the park is October the 9th. There will be food there. We will have a barbecue. We're going to have side dishes. Uh, we need you to bring some desserts and some drinks for Saturday. Desserts and drinks. The rest of the meal will be there. Ladies fall retreat is Lake Fort Smith, uh, November 5th through the 6th. Trunk or Treat is uh, in the parking lot on the east side of the building, Sunday night after evening services, October 31st. Ladies Bible Class meets each Tuesday morning, 9.30 to 11. Uh, men's Prayer Group meets Thursday evenings at 7 o'clock p.m. Uh, the next food bank box preparation is October the 11th at 1 p.m. The boxes will be given out on Sunday, October the 17th. Hay Ride and Hot Dog Roast will be at our house Saturday, October the 23rd, 4 p.m. Everybody's invited to that. Have several on our prayer list that we need to continue to remember. I encourage you to get your hands on a bulletin and uh, pray for each person on that list uh, in the coming week. Uh, need to make an addition. Bob and uh, Betty Jones's uh, granddaughter, Evie Cloyes, is 15. She has had COVID. And she has recovered, but is having some very serious complications requiring some heart medications and some limited time in school. Uh, they are asking for prayers. And I know for some of these young people, as you know, I, I coach. And when we have athletes with COVID, 
we have to bring them back very gradually and uh, they're worried about their heart and we have uh, uh, two or three at, at the high school that cannot get cleared for athletic uh, participation because of these same complications. So it, it's very scary for these young people and uh, ask that you, can, that you uh, add Evie Cloyes to your prayer list this week. I believe that's all of the announcements I have. This time I'd like to have a, a prayer. As uh, uh, Nathan mentioned, there is a prayer list in the bulletin, and at the beginning of each month, there's also a supplement to that that's a uh, more extended prayer list. It comes out, um, came out, uh, you know, at the start of this month. You can get that emailed to you, and it's real convenient to just have it in your email and look over that, and I uh, encourage everyone to do that as well. Let's, uh, let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we Thank you for this day that we can come together and worship you. We praise you for this blessing. Help us to be grateful to you for this. Father, be with uh, those that are on our sick list. Be with uh, uh, Eva Clois. It was mentioned that uh, recovering from uh, COVID. Be with the others that are recovering from COVID. Um, also ask that you be with uh, Dixie Parker and uh, the, uh, the treatment that's ahead of her. And uh, we're so thankful that uh, we can be here this morning. Be with us as we enter into this worship and um, help us to focus our thoughts on you. We invite you to take control of uh, our minds and help us to be focused on you, uh, not just here, but as we leave this place to carry the light of your gospel to those around us. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn to number 587, number 587. Let's be standing, please, and following this song, we'll be led in prayer by Brother Jim Parker. 587. If the skies above you are gray, you are feeling so blue. If your cares and burdens seem great, all the whole day through. There's a silver lining that shines in the heavenly land. Look by faith and see it, my friend. Trust in his promises grand. Sing and you'll be happy today. Press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way. He is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Often we are troubled and tired, sick with sorrow and pain. There are others living in sin, blessed with earthly gain. Take new courage, we cannot tell what tomorrow may bring. When the dark clouds vanish away, then your heart truly can sing. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong, look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song, sing and be happy today. Oft we fail to see the rainbow up in heaven's fair sky. When it seems the fortunes of earth frown and pass us by, there are things we know that are worth more than silver and gold. If we hope and trust him each day, we shall have pleasure untold. Sing and you'll be happy today, press along to the goal. Trust in him who leadeth the way, he is keeping your soul. Let the world know where you belong. Look to Jesus and pray. Lift your voice and praise him in song. Sing and be happy today. Pray with me, please. Dear Lord, we... We're so thankful that we do have this opportunity to join together and worship you and sing songs of praise together. I'm just so thankful for our leaders here at this congregation and just ask that you be with them and continue to give them the wisdom to 
make the choices that will help us all uh, have a chance to live in eternity with you. Just be with us as we go through this uh, worship service this morning and uh, be with those that were mentioned that are on our prayer list and need your healing touch and ask that we can uh, prepare our hearts and uh, to take the things we learned in the message this morning to apply them to our lives daily. In Jesus' name, amen. To prepare our minds for the Lord's Supper, let's turn to number 349. Number 349. They bound the hands of Jesus in the garden where he prayed. They led him through the streets in shame. They spat upon the Savior, so pure and free from sin. They said, crucify him, he's to blame. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. Upon his precious head, they placed a crown of thorns. They laughed and said, Behold the king. They struck him and they cursed him and mocked his holy name. All alone he suffered everything. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. When they nailed him to the cross, <coughs> his mother stood he said, Woman, behold thy son. He cried, I thirst for water, but they gave him none to drink. Then the sinful work of man was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me. To the howling mob he yielded, he did not for mercy cry. He helped him. He took alone, and when he cried, it's finished, he gave himself to die. Salvation's wondrous plan was done. He could have called 10,000 angels to destroy the world and set him free. He could have called 10,000 angels, but he died alone for you and me.
Apostle Paul talking to the brethren at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning verse 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is, is the new covenant of my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you'll proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray. Our Holy Father, we humble ourselves before you, thankful for the love for each and every one of us. We're thankful, Father, that, that you loved us so much and that you sent your son to the cross to die for our sins. We pray, Father, as we partake of this loaf, that we'll partake it in a way that would please, honor, and glorify you. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Let's continue our prayer. Our Holy Father, we continue our thanks unto you, thankful for this, the fruit of the vine, which to us as your people represents that blood that flowed down that cross for the sins of the world. We pray, Father, that we would examine ourselves and we'll partake of this in a way that would please honor and glorify you. Is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
That concludes the Lord's Supper. The elders here, because it is a very convenient time, chose this time to may this fulfill another command that, that God give each one of us that we're to return the portions that he's blessed us with as we uh, serve him here on this earth. We pray that we give much thought to this and that we will give in a way that would please and honor God and that to be with the leaders here as they uh, use these uh, funds in a way that would would uh, glorify God. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we're so thankful once again for your love. You loved us so much that you sent your son to die for us. Also, that love extended to our service while we live here on this earth. We pray, Father, that we'll be thankful for the many material blessings you bestow upon us and that we'll be willing to use those to, to their fullest honor and glorify you. Ask you to be the leaders here as they, they consider the use of them. Forgive us of shortcomings. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you're a visitor with us, we want you to know that you're our honored guest. And we would like to invite you to be back with us at every opportunity you have to be with us. And for your benefit, I'll tell you about the second collection. All I know is it's been going on so long, I don't think there's anyone here that remembers how it got started. But I can assure you it's a great work because it involves children. It's uh, to go, the whole collection goes to the orphan's home in Morton, Arkansas for their use, uh, taking care of those kids. James 1, 27 says that pure religion under the law before God is to visit the widows and orphans and keep yourself unspotted from the world. Let's all be mindful of those that are in need. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we're so thankful for all the opportunities we have to serve you. We're thankful that we have the opportunity to help those orphans at Morton. We pray, Father, that we'll always be con concerned about them and do all we can to, to help them. We pray, Father, that you'll be with them down there and bless them. It's a prayer in Christ's name. Amen.
be turning to number 539, number 539. I'm pressing on the upward way, new heights I'm gaining every day, still praying as I onward bound, Lord plant my feet on higher ground, Lord lift me up and let me stand, by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay where doubts arise and fears dismay. Though some may dwell where these abound, my prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to scale the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till heaven I found. Lord, lead me on to higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Song of invitation this morning will be number 904. Please mark number 904. Nehemiah 2, 17 and 18. Then I said to them, You see the trouble we are in, how Jerusalem lies in ruins with its gates burnt. <clears throat> Come, let us build the wall of Jerusalem, that we may no longer suffer derision. And I told them <clears throat> of the hand of my God that had been upon me for good, and also for the words of the king that had spoken to me. And they said, Let us rise up and build. So they strengthened their hands for the good work. Good morning. Good to see all of you here this morning. I did have a coat on, and I got so hot I took the thing off. So, just laying over there. I know some of you in here are cold, some of you in here are hot. I've oftentimes said the one job in church I do not want is setting the thermostat. Because if I set that thermostat, you, every one of you would either be freezing to death or you'd be heading to the door. Because uh, I'm really hot. Uh, Nehemiah chapter 2, where our lesson comes from this morning. I want to uh, spend just a couple moments setting a little background for what we're going to be talking about. Uh, most of you are aware of the fact, in fact, we've been talking on Sunday morning about Bible class about the book of Ezekiel. You go back in Jewish history, in about 605 B.C., the nation of Babylon came against the city of Jerusalem and carried many of its inhabitants a captive to Babylon. One of those inhabitants that was taken was a man by the name of Daniel. In 596 B.C., the Babylonians came back, took more uh, people of Judah captive, deposed the king, and put a new king on the throne. One of the people they took captive at that point was a young man by the name of Ezekiel. In about 588 or 587, King Zedekiah rebelled against the Babylonian king, he came back against Jerusalem, and in 586 B.C., the city of Jerusalem was destroyed. The walls were burned to the ground, the temple was laid flat, and the city of Jerusalem was basically no more. Most of the children of Judah were taken into Babylonian captivity. Uh, Fifty years later, in 536 B.C., after the Babylonians had been defeated by the Medo-Persians, Cyrus, king of the Medo-Persians, issued a decree that allowed the Jews to go back home. In 536 B.C., about 50,000 Jews headed back to the city of Jerusalem and re-inhabited the land of Judah. Because of opposition from some of the people around them and because, in a lot of ways, because of the laziness of the Jews, 
It was not until 20 years later in 516 B.C. the temple was completed. Seventy years later, a man by the name of Nehemiah is serving as butler or cupbearer to King Artaxerxes of the Medo-Persian Empire. He gets word from some of his friends and relatives that the city of Jerusalem still had no walls. You and I don't think much about walls of a city anymore. But in that day and age, if you were a city of any size at all, you had walls. Because it was the only way to protect your city from the enemy. If you were an open city, you could be very easily attacked. If you built walls around the city, it provided some protection. And so any kind of city of any size had walls. For Jerusalem to not have walls basically meant Jerusalem wasn't much of a city. And Nehemiah became very upset about that and went to the king and asked for permission to go back to Jerusalem and rebuild those walls. One of the very interesting things to me, you turn to Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, and it will tell you those walls were built in 52 days. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Walls that were probably 12 to 15 feet high around the complete city of Jerusalem were built in 52 days with no power saws, no power tools, no uh, concrete mixers. None of these modern day, uh, you know, fangled inventions that we've got all done by hand. All the wood was cut by hand. If there was any uh, mortar used, it was mixed by hand, and they did it in 52 days, which gives an indication of how devoted they were to that proposition. And when you read chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6, you'll find that they were really devoted. And we're going to look at some of those things in just a few moments. But you think about it, and you look at the book of Nehemiah, and you ask yourself this question. How were they able to do that? How were they able to get those walls built that quick? You know, we can't get a government permit passed in 52 days, much less a wall built in 52 days. But they did. How'd they do it? I want to suggest to you this morning there are several principles for success that are found in this story that I think are vitally important uh, for you and I. Point number one is Nehemiah at first found out what the facts were. When you read Nehemiah chapter 1, you'll find, or Nehemiah chapter 2, you will find, one of the first things he did when he got to the city of Jerusalem, he didn't tell anybody he was there. He spent three nights riding on horseback or some kind of animal outside the city of Jerusalem surveying the wall. He went around the city and looked to see where the walls were destroyed, where they were flat, what damage had been done, what needed to be fixed, how they needed to go about doing it. And so he found out the facts. We've got to be able, before we accomplish any task, to find out what the facts are. What is it that we need to do? What is it that's missing? What materials are we going to need? What kind of people are we going to need? What kind of skills do they need to have? And so the very first thing Nehemiah did before he talked to anybody about building walls was he went and found out what shape the walls were in. And I want to suggest to you this morning that you and I have been given a task. And that task is to teach the gospel to the world. And there are some things that we need to know. There are some facts that we need to understand. We need to comprehend and we need, we need to be able to, to understand before we can accomplish this task of teaching the gospel. Well, number one, we have to know and understand that the, gospel, that the world is lost. Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 says, All of sin and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6 and verse 23 says, The wages of sin is death. I don't believe many of us have come, to, have come to the real realization that people who are outside of Christ are lost. They're not lost because they're not good enough. They're not lost because they're not righteous enough. They're not lost because they, don't, they deserve it. They're lost because they're outside of Christ. In Christ is found salvation. And that's the only place salvation is found. And if you are not in Christ then you're lost. And secondly, we need to know, and they need to know, that they need the gospel. Above all, in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, the Apostle Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation, the Jew first and also to the Greek. 
The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. I see too many Christians today apologizing for the gospel. I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. This is what truth says. This is what scripture says. And we need to quit apologizing for God. This is what God said. And this is what we need to know. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. If someone is lost and they want salvation, the gospel is the way to get there. Number three, we need to know that we have a responsibility to teach those people. In Luke 24, verses 44 through 47, Jesus told his disciples that repentance and remission of sins would be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. God has given his people a task, a task of taking the gospel to the world. And until every person on the face of the earth has heard the gospel, has a chance to respond, we haven't done our job. Every, well, that's not possible. Yes, it is. It's been done. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 23, Paul said the gospel had been preached to every creature under heaven about 30 years after the crucifixion, after the establishment of the church. And, and Paul and the first century Christians and apostles did it without television and radio and computers and planes and trains and fast boats and all these modern means of communication and transportation that we have. They traveled primarily by foot and sailboat, and most of their communication was done person to person. Well, I'm saying that, let me say this. I still believe most people are converted person to person. Very few people, and I'm about to, to maybe dinge my own job, but very few people are converted from the pulpit. I am a big believer in search of the Lord's way. Great television program. Very few people are converted because of that television program. Now, that television program lays the seed. It gets them interested when we may not ever be able to get in the door. But somebody is eventually going to talk to that person that has watched that television program. Gospel meetings, campaigns, great things. Most people, think about yourself. Think about the people sitting in this audience this morning who are members of the church. How many of us were converted because of some big campaign somewhere? You know why I'm a member of the church? My mama and my daddy and my grandparents. The main reason I'm a child of God. Now, I went to church. I went to gospel meetings. I even went to campaigns. But the primary reason I'm a member of the church is because of those people who were in my life. It's still done one-on-one. -on -one. We need to teach the gospel. And that brings me to the next point, and that is if we do that, God will bring us success. First Corinthians chapter 3, beginning in verse 5, Paul says, what is it? What, after all, is Apollos? And what is Paul? Only servants to whom you came to believe. As the Lord has assigned to each his task, I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God had been making it grow. So neither the one that plants nor the one who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. The growth of the church is God's job. It's our job to plant the seed. In Isaiah chapter 55, Verses 10 and 11, the prophet Isaiah said, my, or God through the prophet Isaiah said, My word shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish the purpose for which I sent it forth. I still believe the gospel works. The problem is not the gospel doesn't work. The problem is it hasn't been tried. I dare say there are people that you know 
that you come in contact with every day who've never heard the gospel. They may have heard man's version of it. They may have heard somebody's opinion about it, but they haven't heard the gospel. And we need to be taking it to them. Lesson number two, we need to learn to fix our focus. We need to decide what, what's really important, what really matters. When you read Nehemiah, you find there were two men by the name of Sanballat and Tobiah who lived in what the New Testament calls Samaria, north of Jerusalem, who were bitter enemies of the Jews, and they tried their best to get Nehemiah to stop building those walls. First of all, they made fun of him. They said, that wall you're building, a fox is going to break it down. And then they came to him and they said, you don't stop building that wall. We're going to bring our army. We're going to attack you. And then they said, if you don't stop building that wall, we're going to go tell the king that you're rebelling. The king's coming after you. Then Balaam and Tobiah went to Nehemiah and said, you need to come down here. You need to quote what you're doing. Come down here and talk to us. Every bit of that is a distraction. It's to try to get Nehemiah off the task. The task is to build the wall. The task is to protect Jerusalem. And Sen Balaam and Tobiah are saying, stop building the wall for a minute because we're about to attack you. Stop building the wall for a minute. We need to talk to you. Stop building the wall for a minute because that wall is not going to be sturdy enough. Somebody's going to knock it down. Stop building that wall or we're going to go tell the king you're rebelling. Every bit of that is an attempt to distract them, to get them off focus. What is our focus? What is our task? In Nehemiah chapter 6 and verse 13, when Sanballat and Tobiah told Nehemiah, said, you need to come talk to us, Nehemiah sent back this answer. I am carrying on a great project and cannot come down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Sanballat, Tobiah, I'm busy. I got work to do. And this work is more important than what you have to say. In Philippians chapter 3 and verse 12, Paul talked about the fact that he said, I haven't gotten the prize yet. I haven't gotten there yet. But there's one thing I do. Read that again. This one thing I do. This is what matters. This is the focus of my life. This is what I'm trained in on. This one thing I do. Forgetting the past. And reaching forward, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. My goal, my focus is that prize that God has awaiting for me. And you're not going to distract me with things of this world. You're not going to get me off task with something else. Now, distractions are not in and of themselves necessarily bad. We can allow ourselves to be distracted and to be taken away from, from serving God by things that are inherently good. I knew a man who who at one time served as a deacon who was a member of the church in Michigan who quit coming to church because his wife wanted him home. Now, husbands, is it wrong to be home with your wife? I certainly hope not. Is it wrong to put your wife in front of God? Yeah. I enjoy playing golf. I'm, well, I, I say playing golf. I actually hack more than I play golf. I enjoy being out on the golf course. Let me put it that way. Is there anything wrong with playing golf? No. But if you allow that recreation, which is a good thing, to come between you and your service to God, then that's an issue. There was a uh, golf course in my hometown when I was a kid growing up that was owned by the cotton mill in town. Of course, when I was a kid, everything was owned by the cotton mill in town. I really did grow up in a mill town. The grocery store, the furniture store, the, the, the barber shop, the house, everything in town was owned by Regal Textile, and they owned the golf course. And one of the, one of the perks they gave out was any preacher of any church in that town got free membership at the golf club, at the clubhouse. You could go play golf, you could go to the clubhouse. Now, my hometown was a dry county, so there wasn't any such thing as alcohol. 
But you could go eat in a clubhouse. You could play golf all down. You could do all kinds of things you wanted to. There was a man who preached for a congregation, not the one I went to, but another one, who after about six months in town, took his golf clubs to the pawn shop and sold them. And he told some of his friends this. He said, I have spent so much time on the golf course because it's free. I'm neglecting my work as a preacher. Golf to him had become a distraction. And fortunately for him, he gave it up. My college basketball coach, when I went to Alabama Christian, quit coaching because he couldn't control his temper when he was coaching on the basketball court. I saw that man throw a chair one day, halfway across the basketball court. The next day, he was in chapel crying, talking about how horrible it was for him to live his temper like that. And after basketball season was over, he turned in his resignation. He said, I can't coach basketball and be a Christian. And being a Christian is more important to me than coaching basketball. Now, is there anything wrong with basketball? No. But when it becomes a distraction to your service to God, then it becomes an issue. Understand what really matters. Keep your focus. Keep the important things the important things. Next one. We need to be about the business of encouraging other people. When Nehemiah got to Jerusalem, and he surveyed the walls, he found out all the things that were going on. He understood he couldn't rebuild that wall by himself. And so he got the people together, and he said, this is what God has done for me, and this is what we need to do. Nobody can do the work of God by themselves. We need each other. And sometimes I don't think we emphasize that enough. Romans chapter 4, the Bible says, or 14, the Bible says, no man liveth to himself and no man dieth to himself. We are a part of a family. As a family, we need to be working together. I love this illustration. There was a horse pulling contest many years ago. They attached the horse up to a, to a load to pull it, and that one horse could pull one ton weight. They then took a second horse and attached it to that same uh, contraption. And we would think that one horse can pull one ton, two horses pull two tons. Doesn't that make sense? You're wrong. Two horses pull ten tons. Because two horses working together can do more than two individual horses working by themselves. And the same thing is true in the body of Christ. If we can get members of the church to be dedicated and devoted to the work, 50 of us can accomplish a whole lot more than one can. And 75 can accomplish more than 50, and 100 can accomplish more than 75. How many times in Scripture does it talk about the importance of unity and the importance of working together and the importance of being part of the family of God? In Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 24, Paul says we are to provoke one another to good works. Now, the English Standard Version says stir one another up. King James Version says provoke. It means the same thing. Encourage people to do good things. Support people who are doing good things. Edify people so that they will do good things. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 9, Paul says we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field God's building. We are co-workers in God's service. Now that to me says a couple. Number one, it says you and I work together. We are on the same team. We are working for the same goal with the same purpose in mind. So we are co-workers. Now not only are we co-workers, we are co-workers with God. You and I are co-workers with each other. We are also Co-workers with God, which means God is working with us. Think about that for a moment. The power of God works through his people. What can God do? I can give you a better question. What can't God do? 
Well, I can't do this and I can't do that. No, maybe you can't. But you and God can do anything. We are workers together with God. Nextly, we need to fortify our faith. Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 18, one of the first things Nehemiah did when he got the people together was he began talking to them about what God had done for him. We need to, to encourage and, and strengthen our faith by looking at what God has done. Think about what God has done in the past. Think about the creation of the universe. Think about the flood. Think about Daniel and the lion's den. Think about Samson. Think about... David, think about Paul and Peter and all of those great people of God throughout Scripture who have served God all of their lives and the great things they accomplished with God. Whatsoever things written aforetime are written for our learning. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Our faith needs to be strengthened because of who God is, what God has done, and what God will do. If you look at Nehemiah chapter 1, beginning with verse 5, Nehemiah prays to God. And he says, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments, let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants, confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which we have sinned against you. Even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded your servant Moses. Remember the word you commanded your servant Moses. If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by your great power and by your strong hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant, to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name, and give success to your servant today, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. God, this is what you have done. And because we know what God has done, because we know what God can do, it ought to give us great faith. We oftentimes sing a song, the battle belongs to God. It's not my battle. I am a soldier in his army. I am fighting for his side. But my participation will not determine the outcome of this battle. The outcome of this battle has already been decided. Because the battle is the Lord's. And he will win. We need to fortify our faith. Nextly, we need to be willing to face our foes. If you are going to serve God, you are going to face opposition. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walketh about as a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Satan's not after people in the world. He's already got them. He's after you. He's after God's people. And he's not going to sit on the sidelines and let you serve God faithfully every day and try to bring, bring other people to Christ without fighting you back. You can rest assured, if you're going to serve God, the devil's going to fight you. I remember several years ago hearing a story about a man who had not been in the services for a long time. And he met the preacher walking down the road. And as people are always wanting to do, they're trying to explain something to the preacher. And as he walked down, he thinks, i, I got to take the offensive. And so he looks at the preacher and says, I know my seat was empty again last night. And the preacher looked back at him and said, no, it wasn't. And what do you mean it wasn't? He said, the devil was sitting there laughing his head off. The devil is going to oppose you. He's going to do everything within his power. He is an accuser. He is a liar. He is your enemy. He is your adversary. And wherever God's people go, you can rest assured Satan is there too. In 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses 8 and 9, Paul says, I will stay on at, at Ephesus in Pentecost, 
because a great door for effective work has opened for me. And there are many who oppose me. The harder God's people work, the harder Satan works. The more we get involved, the more he gets involved. And just the moment you think you've knocked him out, he comes right back at you. Look at what happened in Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2, and 3, and 4, and 5, and 6. Don't build that wall of fox to break it down. What did they do? They kept building the wall. You keep building that wall, and, and, and we're going to get together an army, and we're going to attack you. We're going to tear that wall down ourselves. What did they do? They kept building the wall. You keep building that wall, we're going to send a letter to the king that, that you are rebelling against him. What did they do? They kept building the wall. The opposition of Satan is coming, and he's not going to quit. He's going to keep at you and keep at you and keep at you. And I suggest to you this morning, I think this is a vitally important point that we need to understand. You know, the only way Satan wins, there's only one way Satan can win, when I quit. Because if I keep going, if I keep battling, if I keep fighting, I'm going to win. Not because of me, but because of him. And then finally this morning, we're going to be successful as God's people. We need to fulfill our function. In chapter 3, Nehemiah chapter 3, or Nehemiah chapter 3, Nehemiah mentions 42 different working groups that were on different spots in the wall. And when you think about it, all of those 42 working groups had to have different kinds of people. There were priests, there were Levites, there were goldsmiths, there were construction people, there were laborers, there were soldiers because they're having to defend themselves against the possibility of any. There were all kinds of people doing all kinds of different roles, fulfilling all kinds of different functions, all with the purpose of building the wall. I remember they told us, I was in the military for several years, and I remember they, I was in supply. And I don't know whether this is still true or not. The, the, the statistics may have changed. But at that point, they told us it took nine people behind the line to support one infantryman. Because for him to be on the line, he's got to have a rifle, he's got to have bullets, he's got to have food, he's got to have clothing, he's got to have all, and all this stuff's going to have to be replenished. There's got to be somebody back there supplying him with things that he needs in order to function. In the church, we have all kinds of different functions, all kinds of different things, all kinds of different jobs. Turn with me to uh, the book of Romans. I believe it's Romans chapter 12. I find this passage very interesting. Romans chapter 12, beginning with verse 4. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not have all the same function, so we in Christ, though many form one body, and each member belongs to the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is encouraging, give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Paul talks here about the gifts that we've been given by God. And he mentions things in that verse that I never would have thought of. You know, I think about gifts in the church. I think about Bible school teachers and, and preachers and elders and, and those, those kinds of gifts. Look at the gifts he mentioned. Serving. Encouraging. Encouraging is a gift. Yeah. Giving. Giving is a gift. Yeah. Leading, do it diligently. Showing mercy? Showing mercy as a gift? Yeah. These are the gifts that God has given us so that we can function together in the body of Christ. And it takes all of those 
working together, whatever your part is, whatever your function is, whatever your gift might be. And by the way, the only person who knows what your gift is is you. I don't know that unless you tell me. So find out what your gift is and then use it. I want to close with this illustration. You may have heard this before, but I'm going to, I think it makes a valid point. Congregation decided they needed to build new church buildings. Between the, the resources that they had and the money they were able to borrow, they would come up with money to do the entire building except for putting bricks on the outside. And they decided that what they would do is that each mem individual member would personally buy as many bricks as they could buy and bring them to the building, and then they would brick the outside of the building with those bricks. There was one gentleman who was, as you and I are wont to say, very poor. All the money he had, he bought one brick. And so he bought that brick and he put it in the trunk of his car. And the more he thought about it, the more he thought he wasn't going to take that brick down there because he would, he would feel embarrassed. You know, there were people who were buying truckloads of bricks. There were people who were buying thousands of bricks, and he only had one. He just left it in the trunk of his car. Sunday morning rolled around. They were having their first new services in their new building. A lot of people came in to visit. The building was packed. The singing was amazing. The preacher did a great job. And after church, nobody was talking about the preaching. Nobody was talking about the singing. Nobody was talking about the building. They were all talking about the fact that on the side of the building, there was a brick missing. Nobody can do your part but you. And if we all supply our parts, the work gets done. If we don't, the work suffers. If the people said to Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2 and verse 18, let us rise up and build. Let's get busy serving the Lord. If you're here this morning and you're not a child of God, you have an opportunity to obey the gospel, to begin your service to the Lord, and if you continue that service, God will reward you with a home in heaven. If you're this morning and you've started on that journey, but you've walked away from your relationship with your father, you have an opportunity to come back home. If you're subject to the Lord's invitation in any way, we invite you to come while together we stand and while we sing. Graces, uh, are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul cleansing blood of the Lamb? Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Number 567, number 567, following this song, Wendell Heffington will lead us in our closing prayer. <clears throat> Restore my spirit, Lord, I need restored. My heart is weary, please help me, dear Lord. I stand in need of more strength from your word. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Revive the fire, Lord, deep in my soul. Stir my desire to work in your fold. Light in my heart, dear God, your zeal grown cold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. Renew my courage, Lord, it needs restored. My cup is empty, refill it, dear Lord. Replace all doubts and fear with faith so bold. Renew my love, rebuild my faith, oh, restore my soul. <clears throat> Number 
Let's pray together. Father, we're so thankful that you provide us with all that's needed for a right relationship to you, a salvation that allows us to be cleansed of sin and to lead us into a greater image of your son. We're so thankful that you provide us with all of our physical needs and the strength and well-being that we have to be able to be here this morning. And Father, we want this week to be able to live out in our lives what you have done for us already and within our hearts. You've redeemed us. You've reconciled us to you. You've justified us by counting us not guilty through Jesus. We're thankful for all of that. So help us to share that great message with other people. Help us this week to be able to talk to people about you, about your word, about spiritual things, just in the course of conversation. We just ask for your guidance to help us to find those with whom we can study and share the gospel with them. And through Jesus we pray. Amen.